Hello everyone, my name is Wilma Hodges and I'll be moderating this session. Uh, please note that all the attendee mics are muted for the session, so if you do have questions, type them into the GoToWebinar question box and we'll answer those throughout the presentation. Um, we'll also save a little bit of time at the end for Q&A, so go ahead and uh, type in those questions as they occur to you. This session is being recorded and will be available later on the Aperio YouTube channel. Um, or if you have any problems with audio and video, um, be sure to enter those into the question box as well. This presentation is titled, Improving Design and Experience at the University of Dayton, Eight Updates Inspired by Our Users. And our presenters for this session are Ryan Allen and David Bauer. Ryan Allen is the Associate Director of eLearning Systems and Support in the University of Dayton's Ryan C. Harris Learning Teaching Center. He has 10 years of experience working in the field of educational technology with a focus on distance education pedagogy and the use of learning management systems. Ryan manages the development, training, and support of UD's Sakai installation, Isidore. He received his undergraduate and graduate degrees in business administration from Heidelberg University and recently earned his project management cert certification. David Bauer is a web developer for the University of Day Dayton and he's currently in his third year developing Sakai. His experience with Sakai includes creating, maintaining, and improving customizations for Isidore, UD's local instance of Sakai. David has a BS in Management Information Systems and an MBA from the University of Dayton. He has attended the last three Open Imperio conferences in Atlanta, San Diego, and Miami, and led a birds of a feather on the technical side of Sakai at the Open Imperio 2013 conference. So I will now turn it over to um, Ryan and David. Okay, thank you very much, Wilma. Um, David and I are here, and we're excited to share the presentation with everyone. And this is going to be kind of a little bit of a fast-paced presentation. So um, we're not going to do any demo. Everything is built into the PowerPoint slides, but the deck is available um, in the conference um, site, so anybody can download it and take kind of a closer look at any of these things that we're going to show. If we have a time to do a live demo, we'll be happy to do that as well. Okay, so just a quick background on the University of Dayton so that you can kind of understand where we're coming from. Um, we've been on Sakai since 2008. There's a, a staff of five that really support Sakai. We have three training and support and two full-time developers. Currently on 293, and we're looking to jump directly to 11 sometime this summer, hopefully. Um, I would consider us to be highly customized. Um, we work on two-week development sprints. We usually do about 14 to 18 releases a year. We try to limit our major changes um, to once per year, so things that will affect faculty um, in a dramatic way, you know, new tools, major changes to those tools, that sort of thing. We don't pay for any custom development. Everything we do is in-house. And in a typical semester, we have maybe about 850 faculty, 11,000 students, and about 2,200 sites um, on our Sakai instance, which we have called Isidore. Part of how we've started and been successful with Sakai at UD is that we're, we're very open in, in having conversations and seeking feedback and suggestions from our faculty um, and students. Um, so really kind of what's the point of this presentation? So I guess the point that we're going to be after is actively listening to our campus community has made our LMS better, engaged our users, and allowed us to reap the benefits of the power of open source software for UD. You know, we kind of approach our daily work is there's always something to do. We're never going to be satisfied, and that's okay. We're, you know, we, we think of that as a good problem to have. So um, always a way to continue to make the experience for our faculty and students better. Okay, so what we'll share today, we're going to work through um, eight different topics. And uh, you'll see that some of those are things that we've reworked within Core Sakai. Some of these are features that we've added ourselves. So we'll spend a few minutes talking about each one of those and be happy to take any questions along the way. So we'll start with um, the Samago settings page. This was something that has been kind of a, a major problem for us since we started. Um, what we would typically hear from a faculty member is, why is publishing an assessment the most complicated process ever? Um, 
So I say that a little sarcastically, but that would be kind of a little bit of the tone that we would hear. And, and I would have to agree with them when we first started using Sakai. You know, the number of categories and option labeling was very confusing. The accordion menus, they just weren't cutting it. You would get a lot of page refreshes if you turned on certain options that didn't make sense to users that would throw you to the top of the page. Um, and we often had to get involved from a support and training point of view. So we decided to go forward with redesigning that page. And this was right around the time that the, the larger Sakai community was kind of condensing the menus themselves. We just um, went a slightly different way. So you'll see that we use kind of a publishing wizard approach. Um, and so instead of doing vertical, vertical uh, accordion menus, we did horizontal tabs. So just as a starting point, you know, typically if you were building an assessment and you wanted to then go in and check the settings for that assessment, you would go through um, in the manner that you would expect. And what you would see is you would see basically five tabs that would kind of work through the process. And not only have we broken um, settings into tabs, but we've basically um, relabeled every one of the options into questions. So instead of saying title, we said, what is the title of this assessment? As in a way to prompt the user to think through um, the details that we're asking a little bit more clearly. So you'll see we have the about section that they would start in. Under availability and submissions, we've kind of reworked this page a good amount um, to hopefully be a little bit more clear. So again, instead of things like open or due date, when does it open, when is it due, do you want the submission to have a time limit, those sort of things. As we work through the grading and feedback page, again, do you want to see student names while grading? We found a lot of success in changing the labels um, to ask questions as opposed to use words that may or may not mean anything to the faculty member. So um, reworking this page was very important and we always had trouble with the assessment feedback, so the bottom of this page. Um, and even as I would train faculty, I'd kind of find myself doing some somersaults around how to get through it. Um, letting people know that you have to decide what level of feedback and when do you want to give it. Um, they were very coupled, but um, they sat at the same level. So, and sometimes somebody would say, okay, I want to give feedback as soon as they're done, but they would forget to check any of those boxes at the bottom and then students wouldn't see anything. So we've tried to make that as clear as possible. Um, under layout, again, we've um, changed these into questions and we've, um, as we always have, picked potentially different um, default options. You know, we've had much better success as most schools probably have by having one question per page. So that's the recommended, that's the default that somebody would get um, in terms of how many questions to be displayed. And once you've worked through all of these pages, you know, you can save and exit at any point at the bottom, but once you work through all the pages, you would say, you know, the faculty member would be asked, are you ready to publish this assessment to students? Um, and that would get them through the process um, and hopefully help them find more success and have more um, confidence in the fact that they're doing the right thing. So the, the first big thing is reworking the Samago settings page. The second feature, and this was something that plagued us uh, for years as well, is having an extended time feature in Samago. So this is a scenario that, that I'm sure others have heard, which is a faculty member saying, you know, I have two students that need to take the test early, and one student that gets extra time to complete the exam. How can I do that with Sakai? And I think um, for many different reasons, some students, you know, require more time on quizzes and exams in classes. So they might get time and a half or double time. Um, and it was kind of a painful and confusing experience for faculty to try to set that up. And once again, our e-learning staff would have to get involved. The only real option was to rely heavily on the groups that would be managed in the site info tool. And you could absolutely make it work that way but it would force the faculty member to kind of leave Samago in the middle of the process to go build that group and then come back and, and, and hopefully remember where they were at. So we decided to tackle this problem. Um, and again, just to show this another way, as we'll see at the top of the screen, um, under the working copies, you would have one copy of the midterm exam. <clears throat> but if you had two students that needed to take it a different day and one student that had you know, had 90 minutes, you would end up having four copies of that exam. 
And this was a lot to keep track of if you had multiple exams in your site, um, and certainly a problem to get all of them collated into the same gradebook column at the end of the day. So if we go back to one of the screens that we had rebuilt um, under availability and submissions, you'll see that we've added a new picture, or a new option, I'm sorry, um, where the green arrows are, which is once you've set up all of the dates and times for the entire site, you're presented with an option that says, should any students or groups receive date or time exceptions on this assessment? And you could just click on that link. And if you did that, if we look at number four in this picture, we can say, sure, anybody who we've put in the 90-minute group, if, we've, if we're using the groups feature, give them an hour and a half. Or number five, we can pick out an individual student in our class and give them the same amount of time as above, one hour, but give them different dates. Same thing with number six, another individual student who gets an hour, but they had a third different time that they wanted to take the exam. So what the faculty member is able to do is build the exam, and when they're publishing it, set up all of these one-offs, but do it within one instance of the assessment. And you'll see at the bottom there, you always have another link that you can add another individual instance. So you can give groups or individual students extra time, or you can also give them extra time and different dates if that's what it needed to be as well. So this is what we would try to work towards, right? We would have one in the working copies, and we would have one in the published copies. That would make sense um, to faculty members, and they wouldn't have to keep track of so many published instances. And for the student, it would be invisible to them. So if you were an average student in the class who was not getting any special time exceptions, it would show up as one hour to you. If you were, in this uh, case, Michael Jordan, who got an hour and a half in this test, that's how it would look to you and that's how it would function. So as long as the faculty member set up the exam properly, each individual student within one version of the assessment would get whatever fit their needs for that test. And this has been a very powerful feature for us and it actually frees up a lot of our time um, to not have to kind of work with faculty to not only set these up, but then make sure that all of the individual instances get collated back into the gradebook. We had a little bit of a, when we first started using Sakai, we had a little bit of a kind of a holdover feature request from our WebCT days. And I'm not sure if anybody ever experienced this, but a faculty member who relied heavily on the forums tool or discussion threads often would say, how can I reply to a student's post without the rest of the class seeing it? Um, and again, this feature was created years ago. Um, but faculty member wanted to reply to a specific post, but they also needed the post they were replying to to be part of the message um, so that they could reference it. So to show you what that might look like, inside the forums tool, you'll see that there is a new feature that we added in there that only the faculty member would see that says reply privately. So next to every single um, post, you could click that if you wanted to. If you did, a new window would pop up and it would have the name of the person that it's going to, the name of the person that it's from who's initiating this. The subject would automatically be filled in and that is more or less the breadcrumb of the site name all the way throughout the specific um, forum and topic that the conversation took place in. And you'll see their original message is also included um, so that you could just start typing. The original message you're replying to is already part of that message. And when you sent that, you would have it go to the Sakai messages tools of the person who you were writing it to. Um, and it would also send a copy to their university email account. So this becomes kind of a private side message that you can send somebody from within the forums tool. And again, a lot of our faculty who work in the discussion forums tool would want to do this. They would want to comment on posts, but not in a way that other students could see it. And this was how we designed that feature. OK, so another project we undertook in the last six months was reworking the gradebook UI. Um, and I just got done watching the NYU presentation on the gradebook they're, uh, they're currently working to build, and it's pretty impressive. And we were sitting here thinking that's, that's uh, you know, has a lot of the nice features that we really wanted to go forward with. And they based their work on a lot of the same things we saw, you know, through verbal reports, 
conversations and surveys we did, we found that the Gradebook tool was one of the most used tools by faculty and checked by students. You know, we all know students love seeing how they're doing in a class um, when it comes to points. <clears throat> but it was very poorly rated by users. It was tricky to learn and it was tricky to teach. So when I would go into a training session, you know, there were certain things that I knew how to kind of train around because they were kind of headaches. So the appearance was outdated, the functionality was, was often buried in the tool, um, which led to overall pretty poor usability. And so when we approached this, we said, this isn't really working for us but we have to figure out how much time we can spend redoing this tool. And what we found in our investigation is, is that to do it the way we really wanted to do it, you'd have to rewrite the entire tool, which luckily it looks like that's kind of what NYU is undertaking with uh, um, the other groups they're working with. So this is what the original gradebook might look like for a, for a faculty member as of six months ago here at UD. Uh, an important point to point out before I move forward is the fact that years ago, when we first moved to Sakai, we made the move to make all grades the default page. So gradebook items is a secondary page, but when a faculty member loads the gradebook tool, they see more or less this kind of spreadsheet look when they get here. So this was the old view. Our reworked view, um, more or less, is hopefully a cleanup to that view. So what we've done is we've taken some of the options and, and we've thrown them to the bottom of the page, options that faculty members um, wouldn't use all the time. You know, we wanted to get the important data higher on the page. Um, all of those export options we wanted to condense into a menu in the upper right-hand side. And we've started to kind of add some icons throughout um, our Sakai instance, like the one you see in the upper right on the Add Gradebook Items button, you know, trying to draw attention. One of the nicest things that I think we've added is the way that we're doing um, categories and the fact that we can have different colors kind of wrap the categories so that a faculty member can easily see what's included in a category, um, what the percentage is. And you'll also see that underneath each item, instead of saying details, which was often a very confusing word for our, for our faculty because what does details mean? Well, it meant go in there and grade, but that didn't make sense all the time. So we changed that link to edit slash grade and added an icon there to um, improve that functionality as well. So as we look through here, some of the other changes we made is when you would actually go into grade, this was the old view of when you would go into grade. And when I would work with a faculty member, it would be very confusing because when they come to this page and they're wanting to grade, that's what they expect to see but you only get a small piece of that further down on the page and you have a lot of stuff at the top that is kind of cluttering that view. Um, the fact that also that you had log and student ID show up as columns before points was kind of confusing to our users. So when we reworked it, um, we basically cleaned up the view, condensed everything at the top, took the edit and remove um, links, turned those into buttons with icons, um, combine username with regular name and move the points column over so that it was easier to see if I'm entering points whose name am I next to as opposed to being three columns away from that data. Some of the other things we did under the gradebook setup page, you know, a lot of this we would look at and we would say how can we make some very quick enhancements that didn't require a ton of work but would be, have a big payoff. So some of those, you know, getting, getting rid of things that don't matter on the page, um, adding more buttons at the top of the page so that you didn't have to scroll down to the bottom every time, um, and also swapping how will you enter grades in this gradebook and the categories and weighting section on the page so that the more often used feature was at the top of the page as opposed to something that was further um, kind of buried towards the bottom. Another issue we would have is if a faculty member was teaching for the very first time and they came into their gradebook and there was nothing there, this was the view that greeted them. And often this led faculty to kind of ask the question, what am I looking at here? What should I expect this to look like? Um, and so part of our change was adding um, a column across the top that when nothing was in the gradebook, it would actually tell them that nothing was in the gradebook and that's why all that space to the right was kind of dead space. 
And again, when you look at a lot of these changes in the grade book, they're not things that I would say, wow, that, this, is, this is anywhere to the caliber of what the NYU project is undertaking. But what we're hoping to do is kind of get a little bit more bang for our buck maybe until that feature arrives um, and make the, the grading experience a little bit more pleasurable for our faculty. And we've had a lot of good feedback um, from the faculty. From the student point of view, again, this was a student gradebook view, very cluttered. And when I look at it, I would have to spend a few moments trying to kind of get my bearings on the page. So we made some just minor upgrades to that tool um, so that we would provide some color if there were categories. We moved the grade directly to the um, right next to the item itself so it wasn't, again, two or three columns over. And we indented the items themselves below. Um, so it provided just kind of a cleaner look for the student. Again, not a huge investment of time, but um, worthwhile in terms of improving the student experience when we know that they use the gradebook tool um, fairly frequently. <clears throat> I think everybody has their own styling for how they handle, you know, what that welcome experience looks like on your instance of Sakai. Um, but again, if we go back to what faculty were saying to us, they would say, you know, what does my workspace mean? What is the worksite setup page for? How do I create a new site? And how do I hide my old course site? These were common things that we would hear from faculty. Um, and these were key functionalities that we needed our users to understand. And, and a point of clarity here, too, is that faculty at UD create their own sites each semester. So we don't create blank shells for every course that's going to be taught this semester. Faculty have to go in there and create a site if they want to use um, our Sakai instance. So we needed this experience to be um, impactful. So when we took a look at this, um, we've always kind of used a tab view at the top, but we made some key changes um, in the last six to eight months that improved this experience. So if we take a look at them, we've changed my workspace to my account. Again, wording that faculty told us made a little bit more sense to them. Instead of worksite setup, we now call it my courses because essentially kind of that's what it was for them. We shifted the order of the items on the left-hand side so that it went home, profile, my courses, preferences, because those were the most used features. And instead of having them scattered throughout the left-hand menu, we thought it must be better to have them towards the top. Um, we changed the styling on our course tab so that you can easily see what term um, and year a course was delivered in. Um, changed the more sites to be distinctively different than how a course site might show up so that users um, could clearly tell that it was something different than the Religion 103 course to the left of it. And then finally, what we did is we engineered a way so that the message of the day is role dependent. So that if you log in and you have a faculty credential coming from our authentication system on campus, you see a specific set of panes. And these are scrolling panes so that it would tell faculty specific information we would have a different set for student information. Um, and we even had kind of a default set for um, guests who might not be either students or instructors. So making those changes was, again, creating a, a kind of a better welcome mat for our users, hopefully. The other thing that we recently did, and again, we have faculty create their own sites. And typically what that would look like is somebody would log in, and we would say, you need to go to my works, you need to go to my workspace, you need to click on worksite setup, and then click on new at the top. And that was kind of an ugly um, proposition and didn't make any sense. And so we've created a button that sits at the top of the menu if you log in as a faculty member that says create new course. And faculty members see that as soon as they log in. And if it's the time of year that they need to create a new course, they would just click on that button to kick off that course creation process. Again, saving us a lot of phone calls from faculty saying, how do I do this? <clears throat> Something that we're coming to the final stages with right now that we're really excited about is adding a question progress feature to SAMAGO. When faculty would set up assessments, they would typically say, what is the mark for review feature? Um, and I would explain it to them, and I would kind of say, yeah, don't worry about it. It's nothing that the, the student is going to use, because I knew that a student could mark for mark a question for review, but they often didn't know how to then go back and figure out which ones they had marked for review easily. 
students would say when we would talk with them, you know, how can I easily see how many questions are on a test? If you're a student and you log in and the instructor hasn't clearly said there's 50 questions on this test, and instead the student is given one question at a time, they can't easily tell that they're on question one of 50 or two of 50. They just kind of keep clicking next until um, they get to the end. Um, you know, they might also say, how can, I, how can I quickly navigate back to questions that I've marked for review? Um, and, you know, what's the point of the table of contents page and how should I use it? And these were kind of sore spots for us because we never had great answers. So we came at this and we said, how can we help students be successful with online testing? How can we remove some of that anxiety that automatically comes with assessment um, and improve that navigation for them so that it's one less thing for them to worry about? So we've created the question progress page here. And what you'll see is that there is a tab on the right-hand side that automatically opens when a test begins. The student can close it if they want to, um, but it's open. And as they work through the test, you'll see on the right-hand side, it will tell them which questions they've answered, which questions are marked for review, and also help them see how many questions or parts are on that assessment in general. Any one of those um, question numbers on the right-hand side, you could click on, and it would jump you back to that question. Because if you're a student and you have a 50, 50 question quiz, and you know you've marked some for review, if you didn't understand how to use the table of contents at the top, which ultimately was a separate page in itself anyway, you would just click previous, previous, previous until you got back to questions that you had marked for review. So what we're hoping is that this feature will help students um, you know, allot their time better um, as they work through a test and be able to quickly return to questions that they've marked for review as they work through it. Again, if you close it, you'll see that the question expands out further to the right so that it takes up more real estate on the screen. And so if you take a look at that, um, what that should look like as you fill these out, um, it will update. Let's see if I can make this happen. This is what you get when you try to put something fancy in a PowerPoint. We'll just move past it. So if you wanted to collapse it, here's what it would look like. And then it would expand back out if they wanted to open it back up. <clears throat> Another thing that we looked at was improving the gradebook sort functionality. Because faculty would also say, how can I change the order, not only of my items, but of the categories themselves? And what happens if I've created 20 items in my gradebook and then turn on categories? Do I have to go back into each individual item and kind of edit that item so that I can assign it the right category? It takes a lot of time and it's frustrating to users. So instead of using the, you know, the old approach, which is the sort on the right, that still didn't allow you to sort categories themselves, we created a new sort functionality. So you'll see that there's a new option at the top of the page that says sort. And users can use that to basically drag and drop items into categories and change categories themselves as well. So in this example, you'll see an item can get drug into a different category. Categories themselves can be switched into any order. And then items can be drug and drop into different orders. So just an example of the sort functionality that's had good success for us um, working with faculty. And then my eighth item. I couldn't figure out what I wanted my eighth item to be, so I did kind of a quick grab bag of smaller features that we've added that have a little bit of kind of bang for your buck, hopefully. <clears throat> so I'll work through these five quickly, and then we can see if there's any questions. So the first one is we've added a release two feature to the forums tool. And a lot of our online classes run in our School of Education, they might have 30 or 40 topics. And those topics are very dependent on groups that have been set up. You know, did I give group A access to all of the group A topics, group B to the group B topics, and so forth? And you could do that, but if you're like me, you know, you, this is like, you know, driving down the block and 
saying, did I turn the stove off? You just keep going back in there and checking to make sure that you're not losing your mind. We've added this feature that sits at the top level, and when you click on it, a small window opens up, and it will tell you who are the users that can participate in that topic, meaning who can post in that topic. Um, and so you can kind of quickly work down the top level page, just click on Release 2, and make sure that you've set up the permissions properly for each of those topics. We also added a quick add feature to the schedule tool. So a lot of times with faculty, when you would show them how to add things to their schedule, there's a lot of options on that page, and it's, it's pretty heavy top to bottom. And so what we did is we kind of enabled a quick add feature. And what that is is um, you'll see on the secondary picture there, there's two items that we're trying to add. All it asks for is a title, uh, date, start time, duration, and then what type of activity it is. And you could click on add another item and define quickly 10 items without having to go through um, a bunch of scrolls, um, north and south, and saves um, to, to really get your schedule filled up quickly. So users have um, taken to that, and, and that's been a worthwhile feature for us. Um, we also added date release functionality to the lessons tool in, in a slightly different way. Um, I'm sure like most schools, we drive um, a lot of our content out of the lessons tools, and faculty would use subpages to chunk their content. So think of the scenario in which, you know, I, want, I don't want Chapter 2 content released until next week. How do I do that? Well, it was kind of clunky to say, click into Chapter 2, go up to more, go into settings, and you'll find the date release there, especially when the edit button that sat to the left was so useful for many other features. So what we did is we invested the time in basically bringing the date release functionality out to the edit box. So if you were to click edit next to one of those items, now you have the ability at that level without going into the page to set up a date and time release, um, and you get to kind of stick stay away from some of those odd conversations with faculty where you explain five steps that you know yourself is a little bit funky, but that's the way it is. Um, so changing that feature. We've done a number of things to improve Samago for students. The question progress was one, but we've also done a lot of different styling. This is one of those pictures where we've just basically striped questions. Um, what we found a lot of times with Sakai is that core functionality is very good, but a lot of the details get dropped off that could make the experience better. Again, this is nothing special, but I think it's nice sometimes just to showcase little things that each of us are doing at our different schools to, to give each other some ideas. Um, so this, again, was just one of those. And then finally, Again, we do this a lot, and I don't know if other schools do this a lot as well, but <clears throat> a lot of times we would get calls from faculty about how do I change my left-hand tool menu or how do I add new tools. And I can train people all day, but the buttons we were seeing just didn't make sense in a lot of situations. And so um, in this case, we changed edit tools to add slash remove tools and page order to manage tools. Again, not dramatic changes, and if anything, it puts a lot more um, pressure on us when we do upgrades to different versions to make sure that all of these customs get in there. But again, all of our work is focused around hopefully improving the faculty experience because we want them to have no reason not to use the system. We want to drive that use so when faculty members give us feedback um, or meet with us one-on-one -on -one and share a lot of the things they wish the system had, like the things I've shown today, you know, we go forward within, you know, within reason to make sure that the feature they want, if we think it will add value to everyone, is added to the system. Okay, that was quick. I thought I was going to take a lot longer. <laughs> um, we do have a few questions that came in. Um, these two are actually kind of related, so I'm just going to kind of batch them together and, and you guys can cover them however you like. Uh, but uh, there were some questions related to contributing back to the community. Are you planning to contribute any of these or all of these features back to Sakai? In particular, um, some of the gradebook changes, are you, gonna, you know, planning to contribute some of that back into the gradebook upgrade project? And also uh, the Samago enhancements. Do you see any challenges in contributing your code uh, back to the community release for Samago? 
Yeah, I'll, I'll let David jump in on that. Uh, what, we, what we find is uh, with kind of having a highly customized instance that a lot of times something that we do for our instance doesn't directely translate to uh, Sakai out of the box. So it takes us a little extra time to you know, build a patch that's actually usable for someone who's running a more vanilla version of Sakai. Uh, so a lot of that time that will kind of hold us up. We also we like to work at a quick pace of you know, always kind of putting out new, uh, new features and stuff. So um, there are a few we've like, we haven't created patches for, but everything's available and we're uh, obviously looking towards uh, contributing all of this back if anyone's interested. Yeah, a lot of this today, as we started to kind of go through it, we said, you know, we're happy to, to kind of work towards creating patches and contributing any of this back. In some ways, we were going to kind of test the waters and see if anybody wanted any of the things that we were doing. A lot of what I like the most about going to a Sakai conference is seeing what other, seeing what other people's instance of Sakai looks like. And it often gives me a lot of ideas for things that we should be doing. Um, even if I don't have the patch, if it's something small enough, I'll say we should be doing that ourselves. Um, but we're happy to um, to get any of these things patched together. You know, we can we can certainly talk with anybody who's interested. If you want to post something in the forums tool for um, for this session, we'd be happy to kind of contact you directly and make sure that we can help you the best way we can. Um, do we have any other questions? I know we had a couple comments that they really liked some of the changes, um, particularly the, the um, ability to release uh, different you know, settings in the, the Samago quizzes. That's been a popular thing that, that a lot of folks have been asking for. Some of the things that we showed today are things, obviously, that you can accomplish in half a day. And some of these are, you know, obviously, like question progress or the extended time. I mean, that's a full-time developer on our staff for Two or three we two or three weeks um, amid their other things they're working on. So it's nice for us to tackle some of these projects. And believe me, we got about a hundred more we wish we could get through right now. <laughs> but uh, I can only make David work so fast. Um, I'm seeing a couple of other comments saying these are awesome, great job, and we really need to get this stuff back into into the community. So hopefully we can incorporate some of that um, work that you guys have done. Yeah, anybody, again, please push us if these are things that you think are valuable. Um, we're, happy to, we're happy to help in any way that we can. And again, the slide deck is out there. Our contact information is, is on the conference site as well, where I put the slide deck. So that's the best way to get a hold of David or myself. Any other questions? I'm not seeing any new questions, just lots of kudos. So everybody seems very pleased with your work. <laughs> so if you have any closing remarks, um, you know, we can end a couple minutes early. Well, the only thing that I'll say is that I, I don't think a lot of what we do is, is necessarily all that special. I think a lot of universities are doing the same type of um, good work that I think we're doing in terms of making our instances better. I do think it's a little bit um, sad and frustrating at times that a lot of this stuff stays local to, to universities. Um, it's hard when we all have full-time jobs and are, are obviously we're accountable to the people at our universities first, so making patches and getting it back to the community sometimes has to take a back seat. But it would be nice if there was a better way, and I don't know if this is something that should just be done more directly through um, some of the dev list of just kind of sharing features. And even if it's a small feature, I think sometimes just seeing things like that pushes all of us to do a little bit better. So I, I, you know, I, I like to see that stuff from other universities because it does nothing but make us better. And, and if we can be a collaborative partner to anybody, that's something we're always interested in as well. well I think so, that's one of the benefits of a, a presentation like this and an event like this, as well as other Aperio events, um, that we do get to hear from other folks and see what they're doing and what kind of you know, creative things they've come up with locally um, so that we can all share and benefit. So thank you very much for sharing all of your um, wonderful work there. And um, I encourage everybody to um, 
go check out the next session. I believe um, I, we have a break from 3 to 3.30, and then the next group of sessions starts at 3.30. So um, thanks again, everyone. Thank you very much, Wilma.